So I married a film critic. So I married a Welcome to So I Married a Film Critic. I'm your co-host, Julia. Hey everyone, this is Bear the Film Critic. Hello. And today we decided to discuss the 1987 film. Mm-mm. 1989. Oh, man. I even wrote it down wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Did your seven look like a... Oh, whatever. 1989 film, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams, yes. This was actually a request from a friend and listener. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, we can do that. Little did I know, this is a beloved film. Yeah, you know, I think what Hoosiers is for basketball, Field of Dreams is for baseball. Whenever people talk about the greatest baseball movie ever made, this this is always one that comes up really high on the list. And the other one is another Kevin Costner film called Bull Durham, which came out the year before. Hmm. Yeah. You have any thoughts on Bull Durham? Ever seen it? I don't think I've ever seen it. I I was a big fan of it for a while. I didn't see it when it came out because I was nine. I was way too young to see Bull Durham, which is a really, really erotic film. Um, Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins are in that film as well. It's a oh, yeah, Ron no, Shel- I have yeah, seen Yeah, she plays it. Annie Savoy, the, the super groupie who sleeps with all the members of the baseball team, including Costner, and it becomes a love triangle between Costner and Robbins and, and Sarandon. Ron Shelton wrote and directed it. It's a great movie about minor league baseball players. I love the film. I don't know that the film's sexual politics really hold up, which is why the movie makes me a little uncomfortable now. I think what was like really super sexy in 88 is a little, you know, a little dated now in some ways. Um, but I, I think for a long time, that was always my go-to answer, like the greatest baseball movie ever, because I, I love the scenes of what the what the players are talking about in the outfield. You know, you always think they're talking about you know, the game and really they're, they're talking, they're having a conversation about where to buy a wedding ring, et cetera, et cetera. There's some great stuff in Bull Durham, some great writing. I, I have the, the soundtrack on vinyl, but uh, yeah, I understand when people talk about how much they love Field of Dreams because Field of Dreams, I mean, for a movie that that's lauded as a, as a baseball film, there's really not a lot of baseball playing in this film, oddly enough, but the film is in love with the sport and the characters pontificate so much about uh, what they love about this game. They, they, you know, there, there are so many wonderful, beautifully written monologues about why baseball is is life to them. Hmm. Um. Do, do you think Moneyball has taken over? As no, no, no. Oh, okay. No. Why? Did you just look it up? Is that now the number one? No. Because I was thinking, oh, what's another baseball movie that's kind of semi-recent? Oh, recent? Well, I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, Pride of the Yankees is way up there. For some people, the, the Kevin Costner movie, For the Love of the Game, is way up there. Uh, the Sandlot, oddly enough, is considered one of the greatest baseball movies ever. I don't quite share that. I Maybe I was a little too old when that film came out, but I, I don't really think The Sandlot is the, one of the greatest baseball movies, but people have, have said otherwise. Um. Yeah, this is not my favorite baseball movie, and I'll, I'll save that for a little later in the podcast because we'll specifically tie into what my favorite is. But I, I do get it. Um, I guess before we start talking about the film, do you remember the first time you saw this? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, then I'll talk about the first time I saw it. It was a big deal for me because my mother and I were living on the island of Maui, and Maui in 1989 got its first multiplex, the first time we ever had three theaters in one. It was the Wharf Cinema Center, which is still in Lahaina to this day. And we took this epic long drive getting there because uh, there's a straight shot to get it. And um, instead, we went this really elaborate back road and we had this really magical day. And we go to Lahaina and we go to the Wharf Cinema Center. And it was this, you know, so exciting to go Wait, to this you new guys theater. took the back road to Yes, Lahaina? we drove past oh Camp Molohia. Yeah, all the way. Yeah. So, I mean, and you only take this drive for those of you who aren't, aren't from Maui. This, this, you only take this drive if you have a lot of time in your hands. And apparently we did. So, yeah, so we got to the Wharf Cinema Center. My, bro- my mother uh, gave my brother Marty and his dear friend Nick uh, stacks of quarters to go play at Fun Factor for, you, uh, for a few hours. My mom and I went upstairs, went to the multiplex, and I was so so excited to see the movie No Holds Barred starring Hulk Hogan, which was sold out for the day. All that driving, all that anticipation to see this Hulk Hogan wrestling movie, and it was sold out for the day. So we looked at what was left, and Fuel of the Dreams was the only non-R-rated movie that was there, so that was the one mom decided to take me to. I'm like, all right, Fuel of the Dreams. We saw it, and we just loved it. We loved it so much. It was for the first time I saw it. It was a four star movie. I just loved the film so much. So my, my mother and I had a, had this really, really beautiful experience seeing it for the first time in a theater. Hmm. Yeah, 
That's one thing I, I mean, you have memories of every movie you've ever seen, basically. And I have no memories of that. It's because I write this stuff down. I think I've, the only memories I have in movie theaters specifically, Jurassic Park, uh, Titanic, and Independence Day. Why those movies? Um, Do you remember the audience reactions? Jurassic Park freaked out. And I remember my best friend was just like, stop freaking out. (laughs) Um, Titanic, uh, because it was my mom and my brother and my sister and my mom threw her jacket over my brother's head during like the nudity because he was kind of young. And Never mind all the lives lost. She doesn't mind that he sees like hundreds <laughs> of people drown, but God forbid you see Kate Winslet shirtless, whatever. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, Independence Day because we bought, it was sold out and we bought tickets for a different movie and snuck into that movie. Wow. Mm-hmm. I think on Independence Day. So that's why I remember. <laughs> because those... that's the American thing to do. You yeah. go see Independence Day on, on yeah. Independence Day. What about when I took you to see The Ring? Remember that? Well, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm talking about like in my childhood. Oh, though. your childhood. Yeah. Okay. Like All right. before college. Because I took you to see The Ring oh, on opening I, night. Yeah. We weren't even engaged at that point, but like you and I were, were dating. And that movie terrified you so much. You were all over me. I'm like, this is the greatest movie ever. I haven't seen it since. No, that was the day. I think that was the night I swore off horror movies. <laughs> it scared me so bad. Well, I'm glad you stuck to your guns. And <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back to Field of Field Dreams. Field of Dreams. Um, okay, so this movie opens up with kind of a little montage of Kevin Costner's growing up, talking about his dad. And, you know, he says that um, his mom died when he was young. He was raised by his dad. And then I guess they got estranged and his dad died the same year that he got married. And we find out later that his dad never met his wife. And um, so Ray, played by Kevin Costner, is 36 years old and he's married. They have a little girl named Karen and they live on a farm in Iowa. And now he's a farmer. And it's kind of this, um, I don't know, he said in... Until I heard the voice, I'd never done a crazy thing in my life. And we kind of see that. Which is what every psychopathic murder on death row has said at one point, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Until I heard that voice, I was normal. Um, didn't didn't uh, the Summer of Sam guy say that? I don't know. Because that's probably another movie I'm too scared to watch. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you'd like that one. Yeah. So uh, is Kevin Costner going through a midlife crisis? Is that what this movie is about? He's young in this. I mean, he's he's playing. I mean, he and Amy Madigan are playing these young hippies, and it's it's endearing. Like I, I do love that fake footage of them. You know, with their with their co- you know their long hair. They're you know they're graduating from from college. I do love that. Um, it, it establishes that they they really partook in the 1960s. They were activists. They were countercultural in their thinking. Well, yeah, he went to Berkeley. They smoked yeah. weed. They were like you know, they were yeah really into it. But then he they moved to Iowa, where her family's from, and he decides to become a farmer, like corn farmer, like literal corn stalks out there. And he's got, he just walks through the corn like it's this magical place, which apparently it is. Do you think that, considering what we know about him when he and his wife were hippies, you know, proud hippity dippities, do you think maybe that he thought like of having a different kind of crop out there and discovered that in Iowa you can't have that kind of crop so let's just do corn instead do you mm. think maybe this was like the backup plan yeah like, wouldn't that make more sense <laughs> <laughs> well it kind of sounds like he... it's like 1989 you know you know pot farming wasn't really you know yeah reputable at that point well it's kind of like... like well I like eating corn so well I feel like he's a farmer but like not a respected one like the the farming community is kind of like that's Ray he like pretends to be a farmer and to their defense when he's in the shop even though I mean it's dealing with his you know having uh you know hearing voices and whatnot he doesn't quite seem to know what he's doing <laughs> he doesn't really seem like a great farmer but his crops look great yeah well they're growing they're growing okay all right so he's out there sort of walking through his beautiful corn i mean they are looming over him yeah they're very i mean it's if if any you know if anything i I don't know there's there's a lot of this movie i don't think we could take literally i think there's a lot of symbolism and 
and visual metaphors going on. I mean, he's he's lost in the crops, basically. Yeah. He looks like he doesn't know how to get home, even though he's yelling back to his wife. <laughs> I mean, the way I mean, is it? I mean, the way Costner is shot, and, and we need to talk about their director, Phil Alden Robinson. But the way he's uh, framed in these scenes, I mean, he is in a sea of corn, which is a way you could describe this film. But anyway, yeah. But that's when he hears the voice, and the, the voice. voice says, "If you build it, he will come." And he's just like looking around, like, "Who said that?" Who said that? He's like, honey, did you hear anything? And she's just like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's dinner time, you know. And I'm thinking, like, reference the fact that he's like a, a kid of the 60s. I mean, maybe he's like, oh, man, it's like really shouldn't have dropped that LSD with <laughs> Timothy Leary back in the day. No, that never comes up. <laughs> but he, I mean, okay, to his credit, he tells his wife right away. Yeah. Like, I, I heard this voice in the field, and she's kind of like, If you build what and who's going to come? And he's like, I don't know. And so he hears the voice in the middle of the night, like it wakes him up. And so he, he then the next day, he like sees a baseball field in the distance where his corn is. Yeah. And this is the second time that he hears the voice. And it's fun because for a second, it seems like Costner is about to drop an F-bomb. He's like, (laughs) who the, like, you know, you wonder like, did they just cut it in the looping or did like, you know, I mean, this is like this is one of the most PG rated PG films ever. And it seems like for just a second, Costner is going to like, you know, revert to his his Bull Durham. Yeah, it's well, I, I don't know. I didn't really get that feeling. Really? No. Even as a kid, I'm like, oh, he almost said the F dash 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 word. <laughs> Fudge. <No. laughs> exactly. Um, so I think his wife thinks he's a little bit crazy, sure. but she is the They're most both nutty. She's the most supportive wife of all time. Yeah. I mean, she's like But insanely so. I mean, they're both loopy, let's face it. I mean, you would you would never think and, and I got to say it, it it speaks a lot to how good Costner is excellent in this and so yeah. is Amy Ann Madigan. It I think they really understand their characters. You would never look at this couple and think like, "Oh, they're a 50s couple or they're like a 90." No, this is these are definitely 60s burnouts they're yeah they're very, like i don't know how their kids are named like you know karen moon child and and yeah you know the, i don't know how yeah and w- w- willow karen's name should be moonbeam <laughs> yeah. exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean they're, they're definitely of of that yeah that ilk so but but ray goes into this little monologue about his dad and how he doesn't want to become like his dad and his dad never did anything he really wanted to do and i think he's he He's 36, which, oh my gosh, I mean, we're older than that. So that mm-hmm. just makes me laugh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm 36 years old and I don't want to like look back on my life and not have done anything. Um, I think, but it's Costner and Madigan still feel, they seem older than 36. than I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. They seem, I don't know, <laughs> maybe just because they're playing parents that, yeah, they seem, they, they seem much older than that. So he, um, he doesn't want to, I don't know, not do the things he, he feels like he needs to do. And she's just like, if you want to build this field, like, let's build this field. Like, what? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can... People have, have spoken about this film as a as a spiritual movie. I mean, I, I think there's some Noah going on here. Maybe some Moses. Mm. I mean, this is... Yes. You know, people... I, I don't know... I, I, I think I think the more you look at this movie in a literal fashion, it kind of unravels or it just it kind of becomes kind of silly or doesn't quite add up together. But nevertheless, this is one of those films that people speak about, you know, in sp- you know, in spiritual tones. And I I do think there's an aspect of that going on here. Yeah. I don't think you can look at it literally, like you said, because there's too much. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. he should just like, gets, be taken after like the the loony bin. We'll get there, but this film gets incredibly wacky, especially by the second and third act. But, so Ray, yeah. they plow down a bunch of his corn. The neighbors are watching and they're like, this guy is crazy because he um, he takes so much of the corn down that is going to put them in bankruptcy. So, And it's interesting because at one point, the daughter played by uh, Gabby Hoffman, she's watching Harvey on TV, the famous film with, with James Stewart where he plays a man who sees a rabbit named Harvey wherever he goes. It's this invisible rabbit that becomes his companion. So obviously there's that connotation of, you know, my father is kind of a 
a loopy do just like James Stewart's character. And, you know, for that matter, Costner has been compared to that kind of movie star. Most of his career has been compared to like a Glenn Ford or a, or a Gary Cooper or a Henry Fonda. Um, kind of these all-American everymen. The field that they build, it is professional level. Yeah. I mean... You really think that that's also kind of the fantasy is that they actually did a really good job. How many farmers do you think that like, I can do that? And they're yeah, like, I oh am. man. I mean, he built bleachers. They had yeah. professional lights. I mean, just the electric electrical alone to get that set up. I mean, what? He's an electrician now? No, I agree with you. I mean, it's yeah, it does it it, it definitely seems like, you know, the production values of the set are probably so much more than what the reality of something like this would look like. <laughs> yeah. It would probably look like the saddest play go- <laughs> neglected school playground you've ever seen. I mean, our like park down the street from us oh, doesn't yeah. even have as good of a field. As and it this. had a bigger budget than, yeah. than, 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 than I mean, farmer like, can sell it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but a whole year goes by, like he's, they show him, it's like Christmas time and it's snowing outside and he's just staring at his sad field. Well, you know what I thought of as soon as I saw that? Yeah, it's, it's insane because yeah, Christmas and like everyone in the background is like, la, 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 and like Ray's like looking out the window like, I built it. Is he going to come? I, I love this shot because you know who I thought of? Because like there's, there's a lot of, you know, again, like I'm thinking about biblical connotations. So I'm always thinking, you know what? You know who else he's like? You know, he's also like that also, uh, you know, that, that young man of faith who walked into a, you know, a crop field waiting for him to come. You know, Linus waiting for the great pumpkin. Oh, my god. It's exactly gosh. like that. His faith waiting for the great pumpkin, the great pumpkin to arrive. Hmm. Okay, so I Because was... his field is also sincere, the most sincerest. <laughs> Well, I realized, you know, nobody could come until spring. Baseball doesn't start till the spring. <laughs> so we had to wait for the right season. He but, should have known that. Yeah. So he's waiting and waiting. It would be weird if they showed up like, you know, snowfall and they're just, you know, whacking the ball. In the, yeah, exactly. So they had to wait they for spring, slip in the spring ice. training. Yeah. 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 So that's why um, a year goes by and he might lose the farm. Or he just hates Christmas and he's just like, I'm, I'm just going to avoid my family. They think I'm... Obsessed with this crop field. Okay, but they use all their savings to build this field. Yeah, which is nuts. It's so crazy. And then one day, Karen, their daughter, sees a man on the field. Daddy, there's a man out there. (laughs) And Ray goes out um, to play. And there's Shoeless Joe Jackson. It speaks to the tone of this film that you immediately know who she's talking about. And, you know, this, and, you know, you you don't think like, okay, it's, it's, the electric guy it's the neighbor complaining about the lights no like we the, the film is so keyed into its tone and the magical realism going on that we know what's up and we know what's about to happen for me that that was a big moment for me watching it last night because i'm i'm kind of i'm 45 now there are things about this movie i'm just very cynical about but if there's one word I would use to describe Field of Dreams, it's sincerity. This mm. movie is not cynical. It's not kidding around. It has its heart and its sleeve. This movie means everything it has to say. There's something about that that's that's really kind of beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I do love that. You know, when when we get to this part of the film, I mean, it's it is corny, um, but the film is genuine about its earnestness, and I, I really admire that. Mm-hmm. So we yeah we, so we get to Ray Liotta as Shoeless Joe Jackson. I love Ray Liotta in this. It's a very uh, young Ray Liotta. He doesn't have a lot of lo- dialogue. He really doesn't. He's got that beautiful monologue about what the game means to him, the smell of the field, the sounds of the game. It's a beautiful monologue. It's probably the one that everyone quotes the most from this movie, and 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 he kills it. But it's more of his presence than anything. It's it's funny because this film has a sweetness to it, but Liotta is still. He's a, he has such a intense presence and I feel like it, it kind of counters how, how syrupy some of, some mm-hmm. of the movie gets. Yeah. And, and immediately there's like eight other guys and he's like, Hey, can, you know, you mind if we practice Ray? And I think he asks him like, are you go, are you a ghost? And Joe is just like, I don't know. <laughs> like they don't really know who they are or they aren't going to tell us who they are. They also we also don't know what's going on in that cornfield because the cornfield is the connecting point between the real world and whatever this heaven or this afterlife is and it's it, you know and honestly it's smart they didn't go there. 
Just yeah. let it let it be let it be a mystery. Let it be a metaphor, whatever however you want to see it. Yeah. It, it, I think it's very wise of them not to get to the specifics of it. You see them vanish as they go deeper, deeper into the cornfield, and it's an optical illusion of them d- dissolving. But beyond that, what it is exactly, and you know, you don't know. Are there, is there some big diamond in the sky that they're going to that's not <laughs> as nice as this cornfield in Iowa? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> But then I, I I didn't remember if everyone could see them, but really only Ray's family can see them right now, and people who believe. By the way, they have a the, the Kinsellas. This is this is Annie and and Ray, the couple played by Kevin Costner and and uh, Amy Madigan. Despite the fact that they're counterculture, former and, and and certainly in spirit present hippies, they have a framed Andy Warhol in their in their home. Yeah. I take issue with that because I don't think of Andy Warhol being that counterculture. I mean, pop art. It was pop art that he created. I don't. I, that's. I don't know if that detail really rings true. I don't know. I, I think hippies like the idea of Warhol, but I don't. I don't know of any hippies that would have a framed Warhol in their Iowa farmhouse. Maybe it was a gift from uh, from maybe the the brother in law. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, her brother. Do you think her brother would have a Warhol? That would make sense. Because he, yeah, he's kind of a, he a would, yuppie. He's, he's, a, he's corporate scum. He would definitely oh, okay. have an original Warhol they would frame. Like, yeah, yeah. put this in your in your crappy farmhouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'll yeah. elevate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Thank okay. you. Thank yeah, you. you're yeah. welcome. I'm glad we could figure out that mystery. One of the mysteries of Field of Dreams. Yeah. Solved. Okay, so maybe we should talk about why shoeless joe and these guys are, are on the field. Because it kind of goes into the... Uh, socks scandal. Yeah, yeah, and it's it, it it's mentioned at the top of the film and the um the the fake newsreel that opens up the movie, which is a really wonderful way, by the way, pu- pulling us into the story. Yeah, they, they mentioned the Black Sox scandal of uh, I think nineteen nineteen, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, my favorite baseball movie of all time is not Field of Dreams or Bull Durham or Pride of the Yankees. It's a film that came out the year before Field of Dreams. It's called Eight Men Out. Came out in 1988. It's about the Black Sox scandal. Shoeless Joe is played by D.B. Sweeney in that film. Um, Who else is in that? Charlie Sheen, John Cusack, um, David Strathairn, Christopher Lloyd. It's, uh, I I think it's the greatest film about baseball I'll ever made because it's not only is it about the love of the game, it's about how heartbreaking the Black Sox scandal is. And the scenes of the players in the field where some of them are aware of, you know, um, how the how these players gave into um, uh, payoffs from, uh, you know. Um, okay, let me just read it. Because oh. the Black Sox scandal okay. was a major league baseball game fixing scandal yeah. in which eight members of the Chicago White Sox were accused of throwing the 1919 World Series against the Cincinnati Reds in exchange for money from a gambling syndicate led by Arnold Rothstein. Yeah, the scenes in the film where they depict the game where some of the players were aware of it and some of them were not, it's heartbreaking and it's so powerful and it's so well done. Um, I think it's the smartest movie ever made about baseball because it's, it's a film that loves the game, but it's also you know dealing with it in a very complex and different way. Most baseball movies are celebratory and you know very romantic. I'm not really into romanticized magical sports movies. I don't like <laughs> The Natural. I don't like The Legend of Bagger Vance. I, I don't like those kinds of movies. I don't. I, I'm i not interested in, in the fantasy. I'm interested in the people. It's why I still want their... I'm still looking for another movie about Babe Ruth. Mm. John Goodman is the best thing about the movie The Babe that came out in 92. But there, I, I think we're still... We still deserve a, a definitive movie about Babe Ruth. I'm glad that we finally got the Jackie Robinson movie, the you know 42 a couple of years ago with Chadwick Boseman, rest in peace. There's, you know, I, I want there to be a Reggie Jackson movie. So bad. But uh, yeah, there's baseball movies, I think, work when it's not so much about the gameplay as it is about the players. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons 42 is so good. And that's why I think Eight Men Out is so good. I understand when people tell me how much they love Robert Redford and The Natural. And that that movie loves the image, the iconography of, of Robert Redford. But I don't think it's a great baseball movie because it's it's such a fantasy. I think Feel the Dreams to cut to it because we're about to talk about this quality anyway i think what's so great about field of dreams it's not really about baseball and if you don't believe me look at there's barely any baseball in the film the movie is about fathers and the way they loom so large in the presence of their children whether they're alive or not 
mm. because it is it's a father son movie, but it's also about Ray's relationship with his daughter, which is it's it's kind of a subplot, but it really isn't. It's a key element to the movie. This little girl sees her father as a hero, and she loves her father despite the fact that her father may be nuts. And she sits with her father outside and watches these games that others can't see. So again, it's it's very magical, but. You're also dealing with, you know, but, but he's also an absentee father because Fuel the Dreams isn't really a baseball movie. It's a road trip movie. Yeah. Okay. I agree with you. I love the parts where he's building the field and he's telling his daughter like all these baseball facts and she's just like asking him all these questions. It's really cute. It's cute. I mean, I, I don't know any little girls that young who are ever interested in Ty Cobb, but I mean, yeah, I, I think it's great. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there are fathers like that out there. Tell me about Shoeless Joe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it, it's very sweet. And there have been a lot of sports movies since then that have like the young daughter. I, f- I feel like they probably stole it from this movie. Everything like The Blind Side or Remember the Titans. They've got like the little girl standing on the sidelines who knows all the baseball facts. Um, I suspect they probably just stole it from this movie. Mm. So one of the things we we don't really know Jackson's role in the scandal, but... Um, in real life, she was Joe's... Yeah, but yeah. it says it's um has been debated it, yeah. how involved he actually was. So mm-hmm. um the fact that he's kind of a main character in this story, you know, I think that's okay because we don't really know if he was like a part of That's interesting. So you're questioning uh the moral standing of the character in real life versus him yeah. in the movie? Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> like should we be like idolizing this baseball player who just like got outed i think like any sports figure we tend to romanticize their ability you know as athletes versus who they were as people which is why you know babe ruth you know the great you know the 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 sultan of swat the great bambino you know we we talk about how extraordinary the thunder crack of a hit would be versus who he was off the field which was kind of a monster yeah and a lot of you know a lot of athletes respectfully not all of them but a lot of them have those reputations or they just have really troubled backgrounds or you know their 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 greatest achievements is when they were in play versus the obstacles they faced in life Mm -hmm. well it's it's clear though that ray really loves shoeless joe yeah yeah and he he loves him because it's a connection to his father it's a direct connection Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the brother-in-law Keeps wanting to buy the farm. This is Timothy Busfield, and he's a good actor. I, I remember watching him in a TV show called 30-something, and he's also he, he, the guy. He has my respect. I hate his guts in this movie. I always have. <laughs> yeah. He's very good. I guess, like, you know, again, great actor. I've always respected his work, but, like, yeah, it, it, he's so off-putting in this. It, it's very good casting. He's a really great contrast. Um, although I got to say, like, maybe it's just because I'm 45 and I'm married and I have a daughter and, you know, I live in a place where land and property are very valuable and, you know, things are very shaky for a lot of people in terms of being property owners. Let's just say that, at, you know, the, near the end of the film when he's like really leaning on Costner to do the right thing and Costner decides to follow his dreams and going, no, man, like <laughs> go with the banker to <laughs> do the smart thing. You could. <laughs> You're like, take your money and run. It's a different movie for me now that I'm that I'm much older than when I was 12 when I first saw this movie. I'm like, no, follow your dreams. Yeah, now we're older and more cynical. Yeah, I, well, not <laughs> only that, I'm you know, I'm just like, you know, he's, he's a father with a little girl and he's got all this land and all this debt. It's, it's a like pipe dream. Yeah, yeah. I, I see, I see, uh, you know, a way out versus you know following the dream, which is the harder thing. And the film is telling us to follow our dreams, and you know, I I, I can't say I always agree with that assessment anymore hmm. okay well he um this is where we realize that the, the brother-in-law can't see the players because karen's like the the baseball game the players and he's like what are you talking about yeah. like and i love it when i think it's there's some like his wife and then the mom are there and <laughs> like ray's family is like don't you see the game? And, and they're like, you know what? It's really not nice to make like make people feel bad. Like, what are you what are you doing? <laughs> I think this moment works because of how funny Amy Madigan is here. Because even she can't believe it, and she's trying it out. And you know, she she realizes how hilarious, but also how baffling this is. Because clearly they can see it, and clearly the other, others cannot. So it is a matter of you know those who have faith are able to see versus those who don't. Right. So then the the voice comes back again and it says 
ease his pain. Ease his pain. <laughs> and, all right, so this is where we kind of see um, Ray and his wife's, like, 60s mentality when they go to this PTA meeting. And, <laughs> oh, man, and there's, scene. like, a book censorship <laughs> issue, which is so funny. I love this. There's been variations of this kind of scene. Donnie Darko had a really funny variation on this very exact same scene. It, it's good. It's good. Um. But it's also, it feels like a very Hollywood version of what would really happen or how a person would look back on it and think like, that's how it happened when really, you know, Amy Madigan is probably the most insufferable person in the room, but she right. sees it as like this big Hollywood victory. Yeah. It's fine. Because Raise your hand if you're for freedom. Madigan, yeah. you know, she is such a good actress. She's married to Ed Harris, of course, and she has had a, a stage and film career that is very impressive and she's excellent and everything but she's been stuck for the most part her film career she's been stuck playing wives and girlfriends she did uncle buck the same year as this film and this is her big scene in the film really because otherwise it is she is playing the doting wife you know the unfailingly loving faithful wife and this is the the scene in the movie where she really gets to cut loose and, it, and she's fantastic in it if anything that's the, how good she is in this scene is what justifies it being in the movie because otherwise this was a really easy scene to lose and that is why right-thinking school boards all across the country have been banning this man, S-H-I-T, since 1969. Excuse me, madam. Excuse me. Terrence Mann was a warm and gentle voice of reason during a time of great madness. He coined the phrase, make love, not war. While other people were chanting, burn, baby, burn, he was talking about love and peace and understanding. I cherished every one of his books, and I dearly wish he had written some more. And I think if you had experienced even a little bit of the 60s, you might feel the same way, too. I experienced the 60s. No, I think you had two 50s and moved right on into the 70s. Annie, look at this. Oh, yeah? Well, your husband plowed under his corn and built a baseball field. That's right. Now, there's an intelligent response. Annie. The weirdo. <laughs> Annie. Honey, it's all right. I'll be cool. At least he is not a book burner, you Nazi cow. Yeah, I mean, the... It, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for this movie. Like, why are they going to a PTA meeting and to talk about book censorship? I guess it. I guess it ties into their, you know, their their love and admiration for the character we learned, whose name is Terrence Mann, played by right. James. Maybe that's kind of the book end to but like. They could have introduced that character in so many different ways, and they didn't need the entire PTA meeting. Yeah, scene. exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, maybe the one scene this movie could have compl- the one scene the film could have lost. Yeah, yeah they. I mean, they could have done it many different ways yeah. but they decided to have like amy man go at go head to head with this like it's like the ending of mr smith goes to washington <laughs> yeah. it's so it's it's you know okay fine i mean this there's a lot of high this is like the movie is like a big high five and a hug and this is just the first of many right so then um but kevin costner's ray is just sitting in the audience reading this newspaper and like putting this it's, it's like the puzzle pieces are coming together he's writing ease his pain over and over i mean it looks like the scratchings and etchings of a crazy man <laughs> is is ray really just like psychotic i think that's one way to look at the film and i'm okay with that i think that makes it even more interesting if you see this as uh, a pilgrimage which may just be a man's psychological journey and also a man's trying to deal with the absence and presence of his father in his life mm-hmm. absolutely I, I, and I, I think that's okay i think it's okay to look at that film that way i think when you get to the ending of the film if you look at the film in a secular way it does not hold up you really have to go all in with the spirituality being presented here but i do think for the first maybe the first and second act of the film you but I'm not going to jump to it yet, but we do get to time travel. There is time travel in this movie, which is crazy. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's a point where you can't just accept it as being a man's inner journey, psychologically speaking. There's a point where you really have to believe in it. I mean, you have to believe this movie's take on the fantastic, like it's back to the future. Yeah. Yeah, you do. So, 
Ray and Annie, you know, Ray is just like, I have to go on this road trip and find Terrence Mann. And she's like, uh, we're going to lose our farm and our house and we're going to lose everything. But then she explains to him, she admits that she had a dream about Terrence Mann, this this fictitious character, having a hot dog at a ballpark. And they both admitted they had the exact same dream. Yeah. And that poses a question to him. Like, okay, look, I know this movie is PG. There's no F-bombs. This is a, this is a sugary sweet movie. But, you know, I, I kind of wonder, are the Kinsellas still lighting up at night? <laughs> If so, it would explain that they would have the same dream. <laughs> or it's, like the kid's asleep. It's time to, you know, uh, no. put on some Hendrix. and. Oh, my gosh. Or if you go with the spirituality part of it, they're both just having the same dream. Yes, which would also be. Okay. Yeah, there you go. That yeah. they're, that Thank he, you for bringing it back to the biblical possibilities. That, yes. they, that Ray's at Fenway Park with Terrence Mann. Yes. Yeah, and Terrence Mann, I mean, it's. I, I read the book Shoeless Joe around the time this film came out, which is by W.P. Kinsella, and I, I really haven't looked at it since, to be honest. But I, a detail I forgot until I went back and was reading about the film. I forgot that in the book it was J.D. Salinger, which is fascinating. Salinger, of course, is the, you know, most famously the author of The Catch in the Rye. My favorite book, for what it's worth, not much, but my favorite book that he wrote was called Franny and Zoe. He's a magnificent writer, of course, but he's famously reclusive. And the movie portrayed, you know, as portrayed by James Earl Jones, the movie portrays him in the same way the other film that fictitiously famously portrays him, which is Finding Forrester, where he was played by Sean Connery. Same thing, belligerent, isolated, profane, mean, um, bitter about his past, defined by his past glories and not wanting to deal with his fans. So it, I thought it was interesting because, you know, you couldn't find two actors more different than James Earl Jones and Sean Connery, but they're both playing a lot of the same notes because this was, I don't know how true it was, but this was the image of Salinger that a lot of people had of him in the, the third act of his life, if you will. Mm -hmm. So they, um, the author of Shoeless Joe put J.D. Salinger Yes, and in, in the, the film, book. it's this fictitious guy, Terrence Mann. And I'm a Broadway nerd, so I hear Terrence Mann and I think of the actor who originated the role of Rum Tum Tiger in Cats. Not the same guy. Oh, okay. Well, but I was going to say, Salinger said his but through his lawyer, if you try and portray me in any way with any adaptations of this book, I will sue you. Yeah, Salinger has <laughs> is, is, is been very... I do remember him being very ad, adamantly anti-Hollywood, and, and that's one of, one of the reasons there's never been a movie based on Catcher on the Ride. The other is that it's an unfilmable book. I mean, it just can't be done. It's an inner monologue. You'd have to really find a way to make it cinematic and completely different from the book to make it work as a movie. Yeah, he's he's untouchable. Mm -hmm. So Ray goes on a road trip and magically finds Terrence Mann through it, a series of just asking people and yeah, bribing them. Question a montage, yeah, just yeah. like hey, yeah, just like doing his Columbo, going door to door asking. People. Yeah, randomly finds him, and enter James Earl Jones. And I got to say, this movie really needs James Earl Jones. I, I I really love Costner in this movie. He's you know. He's been accused of in other films of not only being miscast, but there are times where it's like he's... I mean, let's face it. I, I wrote this in my notes. He is the Ned Flanders of Hollywood leading man. <laughs> Ugly dogly, neighborly neighbor. There's something so aw shucks, gosh darn OG about Kevin Costner. Um, I don't. I don't think people would say that now. No. Now that he's in Yellowstone and like doing new things. <laughs> no, 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 yes. and, and no, no. To your point, you're absolutely right. At this point, yes. Um, but no, no, I agree with you. And Mr. Brooks is another one of those. Uh, he's played a lot of villains. He's done some edgy, interesting stuff. But at this point, yeah, he was who he is in this movie. Let's just say, I think a lot of people think, think you know, they think of him and the untouchables, just the square Hollywood leading man. But he's excellent in the movie. What I'm trying to say is he's also as square and as corny as the film is. So when you get to James Earl Jones, you, you got a real heavyweight. Mm -hmm. and the movie needs that. Jones is firing on all cylinders, as he always is. This is one of our greatest living actors. I'd say certainly one of the 10 greatest theater actors of all time. I'm completely serious about that. I'll say this really quick. The 1984 production on Broadway of Othello, where Othello was played by James Earl Jones and Iago was played by Christopher Plummer. Everyone I know who saw that production says it's the greatest bit of theater they ever saw in their lives. 
Jones is the man. I know most people think of him as the voice of Darth Vader, but like That's this, what I was thinking this about. guy is, or 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 the the King of Zamunda. But he is he's <laughs> he's one of our greatest living actors. He is, and even when his even when the dialogue, even when the character is a little over the top, or you know just a you know just a bit much, he's perfect in this. Mm-hmm. He's magnificent in this. In fact, I love his work in this. The movie really really needs him. Okay, I understand your desire for privacy and. I wouldn't dream of intruding if this weren't extremely important. Oh, God. I don't do causes anymore. This isn't a cause. I don't need money or an endorsement. Refreshing. You once wrote, there comes a time when all the cosmic tumblers have clicked into place and the universe opens itself up for a few seconds to show you what's possible. Oh, my God. What? You're from the 60s. Well... Yeah, actually. Oh, hey. Back to the 60s. Wait a back. second. There's no place for you here Just... in the future. Get back while you still can. You've changed. You know this? Yes, I suppose I have. How about this? Peace, love, dope. Now get the hell out of here. So Ray somehow manages to convince Terrence to go to this baseball it's, game with it's him. It's from the first of many contrivances here. yeah yeah so they they go to the ballpark and then the voice comes back again well you don't want to talk about the shenanigans where where james L. jones is like basically stalking costner around his office nearly bludgeoning him and oh i mean yeah you, yeah and then he says you're a pacifist it's a it's a lot of slapstick for this movie <laughs> yeah 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 I don't it's know. basically like a fight scene that almost happens a couple of times with them. Yeah. Until finally, yeah. Costner, Ray basically convinces Terrence Mann to go to the ball game with him. But it, I mean, it is like a crazy person asking, a, asking, you know, the person they're obsessed with to indulge them just once. Yeah. Yeah. So they go, uh, they go to the game and then the voice comes back and says, do you know what it says? Go the distance. Right, right, and then not and that's one thing, but then the voice has the power to magically put sports stats up on the jumbotron. Yeah, yeah. So it puts like Moonlight Graham and all of his stats up there. It's so I, I mean that's and Ray is just like furiously like writing stuff down, and and then he's like, "Did you hear that? Did you hear that?" And Terrence Mann is like, "Hear what?" And he's like, "You know." Let's... Do you think there was a guy running the jumbotron who like this is weird? I I, I hear a voice telling me to write down stats on this player from like the olden days no i i mean it was just um i don't know magically do you think the, the voice has the like like type space yeah it, the voice has hands and a typewriter <laughs> an old-timey typewriter yeah yeah of course um moonlight graham stop 1917 <laughs> stop so then they just leave because Ray is just like, you know what? Never mind. It, I don't know why we did this. And takes him back to his apartment. And then Terrence Mann like, lets it out like, all right, I heard the voice too. It, James Earl Jones very dramatically steps in front of the car. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's like, great. I heard the voice. Go the <laughs> distance. Yeah. 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 Such is the subtlety of, of Field of Dreams. So they now are on a road trip together. And they're going to find Moonlight Graham. Yes. Who's now Doc Graham. Mm-hmm. And they go to um, a little town where he lived. They find out he died 16 years earlier. And then Ray meets his ghost. This is nuts because, <laughs> I mean, we're already dealing with voices and magic jumbotrons, but then... <laughs> So it's a funny bit of business where James Little Jones is man. He's he's they're sharing a hotel room together or motel room rather motel, and uh, man has to call uh, was his it? dad his dad to explain yeah. to him that he has not been kidnapped or dad because apparently he finds out from a newspaper that he's been missing. So he has to deal with that. It's a nice bit of comedy, a bit throwaway from James Little like, Jones. What am I going to tell my dad? <laughs> Costner walks outside and immediately he's gone back in time to 1972. Is I mean, that what he did? Yes, because the Godfather's playing on the marquee. The 1972 oh. is on the license plate. Yeah, he's walked into 1972, oh. which is bonkers. 
Okay, that's crazy. That is crazy. I thought it was like no, a no. shoeless Joe situation where he just sees his ghost. No, he's gone back. He's Marty mcfly it. He's back in time. And he walks a corner, and there's Burt Lancaster as, as you know, as Moonlight. Doc, Doc Graham. Doc Graham, yeah. And, you know, like, for one thing, look, I mean, this is this is the last, this is one of, this is, no, it was, it was the last movie that Burt Lancaster ever did. Legendary, legendary actor, and he looms very large, and... I mean, this this is a guy who I mean at this point everything that came out of his mouth you just kind of lean forward. I, this is the casting of Burt Lancaster is as is as wonderful here as as having James Earl Jones and his scenes have such gravity. Even when the dialogue is a little corny, he keeps giving the same anecdote about his wife. I just Lancaster just rules this movie. So it, I think the fact that he's so good and and Costner is playing off of him so well. I think it almost makes you overlook just really how completely absurd the story yeah, is at this point. because I didn't even realize that, but... Oh, yeah, they're time, time travel. So Doc played one day of baseball before he got out. I don't really understand that part. It, it, this, is, this is a true thing. Yeah, he, uh, he, he got to the majors, and uh, yeah, he, uh, he ditched. He ditched. He ditched. Okay, so he he. Goes. People have said he choked. People said that he had you know an epiphany. But there's it, historically there you know it, it, it's a it's a fascinating anecdote that made its way into his film that you you know you have guys. Oh yeah, because he didn't get a hit. Right. Yeah, and so he said, um, if I'd gotten a hit, I would have stayed in baseball. One inning changed the world because he then became a doctor and like saved all these people's lives. And it's speaking to chance. It's speaking to you know following your dreams, following your passion, following your vision. You know, so it's it's a nice you know commenting on the on Kinsella's own journey as mm-hmm. you know someone who is literally you know taking this insane walk of faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then he walks back into the present. He yes. goes back to the future. He just randomly, yeah, without the help of a DeLorean, he just simply goes back to his hotel room and just tells, "Hey, James Earl Jones, I just." Spent like the last hour in 1972 with a dead baseball player. <laughs> we'll go. Okay, so then they decide to go back to like man decides to go back to the Ray's house with him. You almost said Back to the Future. You I almost, did say you, Back to the Future just then. You did? I did? Yeah. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> anyway, continue. <laughs> I think I said that in another podcast. It's just so relevant to all these movies. Anyways, they are. Driving back home to yes. Ray's house. Yeah. And then they pick up a hitchhiker. Played by Frank Whaley. Great character actor. Who is Archie Graham, which is Doc Graham as a younger man. Yeah. So he's a ghost he's hitchhiker. He's a ghost hitchhiker. Ghost hitchhiker. Ghost yeah. hitchhiker. Okay. Yeah. It's the, at this point, this movie has gone so bananas. <laughs> and you go with it because not, not only is it charming and old fashioned, but again, it's earnest. There's no, like, the movie is not kidding around, there's no winking at the camera. There's not in like the James Horner score and the way the actors are playing it. Like that this film is saying, no, go with it. This, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Let us take you on this journey. Yeah. Just, just go. It's magical realism. It's, you know, in, in a, in a, in the foray of baseball and, you know, a man's, you know, journey of, of self and connecting with his father. Yeah. Um, but it's still nuts. It's completely <laughs> nuts. Even watching it last night, I'm like, this is crazy plotting. I can't believe they got away with this. Well, okay, so then Ray and tells Terrence Mann about his dad, and this is when we find out that they were estranged, and he, once he left home and went to college, he didn't really stay in touch with him. So that's why he just has such a angsty feelings about him, yeah. and why he doesn't want to end up like him, and, and you know... When he's, he remembers him at the same age that he was just looking really old and like worn down. And I don't know. I think that's hard for us to see our parents like age, even though, again, if he's talking about his dad at age 36, I have a hard time believing his dad looked that old, but maybe he was older than him. Well, the movie's playing fast and loose with this idea of, this was something that drove me crazy because I was reading about i was reading about the 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 logistics of how these ghost characters when they're playing baseball they're talking about when they died but also when they stop playing baseball they're very aware of the world 
that they used to live in in the world now because one person said that there's a joke a player makes about the Wizard of Oz where he goes, I'm melting, I'm melting, as he's walking into a field. And the thing is, you know, the the Black, oh, right. Black, Black Sox scandal was 1919. Wizard of Oz didn't come out for 20 years later. And someone was making the justification that perhaps later on in life he would have been aware of that, even though the movie is betraying them at this specific point when they were young baseball players. And the thing is, I'm, you know, I'm going like, look, that's neither here nor there. This movie is nuts. You just, you have to, I mean, it's like a dream. It really is like a literal dream. It has dream logic to it. Um, take it or leave it. Yeah. You know? So they get back to the farm and Archie just joins the guys like, He's just one of them, like, no problem. He plays with the team. And then it just gets a little bit crazy because Stinky Brother-in-Law comes back. Timothy Busfield. Yeah, and he's like... Buzzkill, the movie. Yeah. And so the family, Ray's family is and um, Terrence Mann are watching the game. And they all seem like insane people were just staring at this empty baseball field yeah. when really there's these ghost players playing. Which yeah. Is- and they keep bringing more of them. Like, they keep bringing more players each time. Yes. And so it's no longer practice. It's a full on game. It's a full on game. They got all the players. And so the brother in law is like, Ray, they're going to foreclose on you. But I here you you sign this paper and you can stay in your house. I'll take over the field. You know, like he's telling him, we'll get rid of this baseball field thing that you did because that was crazy. And we'll put corn back there. And (laughs) all of a sudden, what? The Karen and Terrence Mann, they're like, people will come. People will just get in their car. They're just going to come here. And they're not going to know why. And you can charge $20 a person. And what? They're all just going to sit on these bleachers and watch ghost baseball? Here's the thing about this scene. It's not a very well-written monologue. It's basically, it's the same phrase that just they just keep going back to it. There's something clunky about it. Two things. James Earl Jones has the monologue, and as delivered by him, it's fantastic. And the other thing is that the way it's staged, you brought notice, James Earl Jones gets up and he starts to do like this little walk, and then all the players stop what they're doing, and they're walking towards him very slowly. It's very theatrical. Mm-hmm. I thought, this could work as a play, because look at this. Look at this staging. This, is, this isn't like cinema. This is theater. And had it been an actor lesser than James Earl Jones, this scene would have been so clunky and awful. But it really does make the hairs in the back of your head stick up. Mm -hmm. It's really fantastic acting. Yeah, because he's talking about people want to go back to an innocent time. Have a genuine experience. Yeah, they want to watch baseball. For $20. Yeah. For $20 donation, they'll have a genuine experience. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, movie. (laughs) They want to, but they want to like, Watch a game and eat a hot dog. And I'm like thinking... At a farmhouse with a framed Warhol painting. Yes. I'm like, oh, so wait. Do they have to start making food now for these people? <laughs> like, what? what is Ray's wife going to have to open up a hot dog stand? <laughs> well, we'll get to the hot dogs because that ends up being a part of the climax. So so anyway, so this moment happens where... Yeah, where... Where, and the thing we alluded to earlier where Costner is basically like, screw logic, we're going to go broke. Yeah, he's like, no, I'm not signing I'll paper. have to live in this cornfield with my family. <laughs> we'll be eating corn shucks for the rest of our life. <laughs> we're the freaks in the cornfield because we're broke and I made this stupid decision. No, he he follows faith. He you know completely says adios to logic and you know tells, tells Timothy Busfield to shove off. And then a series of events happen that, again, like... Any other movie, th- this thing would be slapped so hard in the wrist for bad screenwriting, but somehow this movie gets away with it. So if you can help me piece this apart like it's the Zabruder film. So a scuffle of sorts happens where evil Timothy Busfield knocks... Okay, he grabs okay. Karen. Grabs he, the little he girl. He like grabs Karen and he's like, you're taking your daughter into this delusion with you. <laughs> and he's like, look what you've done to her. And then like somehow... I don't. I I think he maybe meant to just like sit her back down, but like pushes he her. He throws off. her off. He the basically bleachers. throws her off the bleachers. He like, throws her off, like off the top seat, yeah. and she falls and like lands on her back. I mean, look, the thing is, again, it's Field of Dreams, but 
in a different kind of movie, this would look like an act of murder. Okay? Yes. He takes her and throws his little girl <laughs> off the bleachers. His own niece. It is his niece. <laughs> it's insane. And so she falls down. You think she's dead. The okay. movie makes you think she is okay, dead. Seriously, the fact that Kevin Costner didn't like punch this guy's lights out, I don't know. The movie doesn't seem to want to deal with the fact that he, that Timothy Busfield is the villain, but we'll get into that in a moment. So... So anyway, so the little girl is dead because Timothy Busfield has killed her and they all run to her and they're going, oh my God. Well, all the players are watching the shenanigans too and suddenly Frank Whaley playing the young Moonlight steps forward and the camera goes down to his feet in a really 80s dissolve. The legs turn from from the baseball uh, uniform to the the legs of the old man in a a pantsuit and and it's It's uh, Doc Graham. It's Burt Lancaster some really bad you know morphing of the day so he goes over and gives the girl a pat on the shoulder she spits out a hot dog okay and he goes you know like like oh I got a hot dog lodged in there i know and i was like was she even she was eating? not eating a hot dog was she even eating anything i'm like is that a reshoot because they didn't want us to remember that timothy busfield just threw this girl off of a bleacher yeah like she I- it's crazy. It's, it's so crazy. It's so bananas. Yeah, because I'm thinking, like, she was not eating a hot dog movie. No. No. The- and that's insane. And she didn't choke. She was thrown off bleachers. <laughs> this is an act of murder. This this isn't this is an Oscar Myers fault. It's Timothy Busfield's fault. <laughs> movie. Again, Ray should have knocked him out. And the wife should have. He should have taken Timothy Busfield, thrown him into the field of dreams, where Shoeless Joe and the other players could have baseball batted him to death. <laughs> and then they could have dragged him into the field, into the actual cornfield. Yeah, and it's field of nightmares. Now, now we're talking my kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> but no Kevin, they could have turned into like the black spirits from like ghost um, oh and they both no actually better movie better no, movie I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no but um it's crazy because the the mom is gonna go call 911 and then it's Ray, like wait yeah wait one of the ghosts is stepping forward <laughs> oh to what take our girl into the to the tunnel <laughs> is she going towards the light now like what's happening is Unchained Melody going to start playing? Yeah, oh it's it's gosh. it's bananas. It is bananas. I know. And this movie, this freaking movie gets away with it because it's Burt Lancaster who, I mean, Burt Lancaster could play Barney the Dinosaur and you'd still be like, ooh, it's Burt Lancaster. I mean, the guy just, he's just one of these movie stars. He had this quality that just is indescribable. He, he makes us believe in this scene. He, We're touched that he brings this girl back to life. I mean, really, like, I, I got to tell you, like, I'm of two minds. I was watching this. I'm like, I'm buying it because I love this film. And, you know, again, the sincerity. Uh, but I'm also like, man, if it was any other film with lesser actors, I would say this is the biggest crock I've ever seen in my life. Because <laughs> this is crazy plotting. Because yeah, they, made, they made her look when she was lying there. She's dead. Like, she, like, like, broke her neck. Like, yeah, like, she just had a full-on concussion and passed out. I'm like, man, this this movie just got dark and edgy. This is so disturbing. Do you, do you think, like, audiences, like, saw this and they were just like, what the heck is going on? I can vouch. I saw this, you know, with my mom. No, and I remember- no, like... A pre-screen audience. Do you think they they did a reshoot? I I of... think the hot dog thing was a reshoot because yeah. this little girl, to my knowledge, was not eating a hot dog. There's no hot dog in the scene. <laughs> oh my gosh! So yeah. they're like, okay, we don't want. So she comes back to life and she's just totally. Fine. She survives the hot dog slash being thrown off a bleacher. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. yeah. That was crazy. Yeah, and then and then like the nut, it, it the nuttiness doesn't stop there, listeners. Like. Burt Lancaster's like, I have to go home now because he stepped out of the field. So therefore, you know, it's, that's it. Yeah. Never mind that he just redeemed him, his soul. I mean, like, he's he's now like, I mean, like, you know, not only is he a rock star on the field of dreams, but in the real world, he did this really beautiful, noble act. Shouldn't that give him like... Well, he leaves through the field. I know, but it's like, it's, he's being punished for doing this good thing. He uh, really is. Yeah. I... I know. I think that film is trying oh, to well, say... Oh, well, back to being dead. <laughs> no baseball for you. Oh, back into the... Hey, is this... I smell sulfur. You, you guys, is this the right... Keep going? Okay. I Goodbye. Th- well, it's crazy that... Okay, is the film trying to say that because 
Archie chose to be a doctor in real life, that even in death, he has to make the same choice. That he's not worthy of the field of dreams. Yeah, it's kind of I don't like, no, I don't like that. And because there is, there, there's, I don't know if the word really applies to this film, but, but there is a sense of poetry going on visually. There is a sense of, again, just, just magic. It's a, it's a magical story. Not, in the, not as a, not as a commentary, end, but this movie exists in a world where magic is what it is. So you kind of just go with it. Again, and primarily because there's no explanation to any of this. Okay, but he did get to have his last wish. Because he said his last wish was just to like hit a ball into the outfield. You yeah. Know? And he did get to do that as young Archie. He does that and he dislodges a hot dog from this little girl's throat. So technically... Did he the- put the hot dog there? No. So he's, like, he's like, I'm going to make it okay for no. this family. Here, girl, your quick hot dog mouth. No, that's a crazy theory. <laughs> No, but he the field did give him his one last wish. Because sure. he did tell Ray when Ray went back in time <laughs> that that was his wish. <laughs> <laughs> what if what if Ray like walked in the wrong direction? Would he be like, oh no, it's nineteen seventy three now? I I gotta like I don't know how this I gotta goes. wait twenty twenty something years so I can get back to Iowa. Oh yeah. my gosh. So then Mark the bad brother Busfield, yeah. Yeah. He uh he finally sees the players after I, you know what? I, this character doesn't, doesn't deserve does, to see the players. No, I don't get that at all. Uh, suddenly like he's worthy of the f- No, he's not. He's no, the, the movie should it should be like you are the worst real estate agent ever. You're f- at least have Kim Acosta go, you're fired. Get out of here. Like that should have been that. And so it's like, "Oh, he's not such a bad guy." So this character gets redemption even though he doesn't deserve it. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. And the movie's saying like, oh, he didn't just, you know, try to murder his niece. It was a ballpark Frank. It's okay. (laughs) Good thing Ghost Doctor came around and smacked that hot dog at the back of the throat of this little girl who just fell a few feet off a bleacher. Yeah, that, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So I, I don't like that Mark gets to see the players. No, I, no. I feel like he doesn't have faith. If anybody you know? should have to go into the cornfield of death, it's Timothy Busfield. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't have faith, so he doesn't deserve any. No, of like, this. What, why does he suddenly? Have, well, because he because he almost because he saw the error of his ways. Is it because he saw Archie turn into an is, old man? Is that why? Yeah. Oh, that because because the the thing is like the the joke is that he suddenly goes, oh, like where did all these guys come from? Right. Yeah. So. All right, because if he didn't see the Doc dot Graham, yeah, then what? He's just gonna watch this little girl like throw up a hot dog without knowing why. Yeah, would it be? <laughs> <laughs> she has like, <laughs> it's like something out of The Exorcist. She's like twitching. She's just like and so she leans forward and yeah, yeah, and, and then Mark... and they're like they're talking to nobody. Like, thanks for saving our girl's life. And Mark's like, what are you talking? You're all insane. Ooh, he just like screams, "You're all insane!" and just like runs off. Yeah, better. That better. Was, that's better. Yeah, yeah. but it, you know, it's Field of Dreams. This movie just wants to hug you over and over again. Okay, so what do you think about Shoeless Joe inviting Terrence Mann into the cornfield? <laughs> it's weird. And he's like, and then Ray gets upset. And why is it me? Yeah, I built this field. Yeah. And and Ray's like, is that why you did it? You just did it for yourself. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> I'm just of like, course he did. <laughs> of course he should get something out he, of it. I mean, he didn't know all of you guys were gonna be here, you know. But I, he missed Christmas for this. Okay, <laughs> the guy blew up watching It's a Wonderful Life on TV for this. Yes, he definitely deserves something. Take him into the cornfield. Let him see the afterlife. Absolutely. Oh, because they keep asking the question, like, is this heaven? And I'm like... No, it's Iowa. Well, but... To which the Iowa Chamber of Commerce is like, yes, we got it. But I feel like... Yeah, exactly. They're like, this is our movie. But... I'm sure that that's like the sign off whenever you watch TV in Iowa, like they show that scene. Good night, everyone. Yeah, but... It's funny because these players don't know if they're really ghosts. They don't know if this is heaven. Like, what do they know? Yeah. Where, where are they? Are they? Is this purgatory? <laughs> yeah, the one thing they're really confused, like, oh, it's strange that you guys use lights on the fields because yeah. you normally, it, 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 it prevents you from seeing the ball. Yeah. So anyways, man gets invited into the field <laughs> and he's just so excited. And he tells Ray he's going to write about this experience. But I, 
does he come back from this experience? No, of course not. He's no, this is it. Is this him ending his life? Yes. Yes, he's, he's going into the light. Yeah, it, you know, it, Oscar Mayer couldn't kill the daughter, but he's just going to be like I'm I'm yeah, this is it for me. So it's kind of like I'm going home. Is this the equivalent of just like him killing himself? No, no, no. I think it's more romantic than that because it's Field of Dreams. I think uh I think because he took a leap of faith. I mean, this is this is the end of his journey. He took a leap of faith like Ray, and his leap of faith is being rewarded um by not only falling in love with baseball again and having an intimate relationship with baseball and, you know, taking this giant chance on traveling cross country with Kevin Costner. Is um, this really easing his pain? Yeah. Yeah. Because he has something he has something to to believe in again. He has something to belong to and and he keeps, you know, this uh this insane farmer from doing the right thing to uh, you know <laughs> He keeps Ray from his financial responsibilities. So. Yeah, he helps him, you know, g- you know, uh, basically plunge headfirst into financial ruin. Yes, thank you, Terrence man. <laughs> so yeah, so he walks off and I mean it, it is peculiar, but I mean again, like I think we're supposed to just embrace the romanticism of it because, again, we don't know what's in that cornfields. You know, this isn't like children of the corn. We don't know, like, what's out there for these guys. Um, but apparently it's something wonderful. Mm. So all the guys go back into the field, and there's one guy left, mm-hmm. and it ends up being Ray's dad. Played by Dwyer Brown, who I like a lot, really good character actor, and I like this scene a lot. Um yeah, it's good. It's it's good casting. They do look like they could be father and son, mm-hmm. and it's interesting because this is a character, um, the character of the father. This is him young at a younger part of his life, so you get the sense that he's younger, cost- like before he became a dad. This makes sense. I mean, you know, when I, it's weird. I don't know if you feel this way. When I think of my father, and you know, my my father is about seventy five right now, and you know, I don't think that would mind me saying that. I think of my father the way he looked in the eighties. You know, mm. so I think there it makes sense in a sit, you know, to go with the films the way the movie is is exploring this idea of father and son. I think it makes sense that he is at this age that he looks this way. Um, in fact, I think it makes him even more imposing, contrasted with Costner. This is not an old man. This is this is someone who has all the youth, all the idealism that Costner's character does. Yeah, well, and and it, you know he talks in the early, you know, in the first part of the movie where. He just remembers him as old and not having fulfilled any of his dreams. So now he gets to see him young at like kind of the beginning of what his life was like. And I think he gets to realize like, oh, you know, everybody kind of starts off that way. My dad had the chance and then he made his choices and, you know, we all end up where we end up. But um yeah, because I think it's like as kids, we don't get to see our parents before they had us. Like we don't, we know they had a life before us, but we don't really care about that. <laughs> There's a movie out right now, yeah. not to derail this, and I'll say this really briefly. There's a film I write, a French film called Petite Maman, which is about a little girl oh, who yeah, gets to I meet. I really want to see yeah, that. Yeah, we'll watch it. Um, it's a little girl who gets to meet her mother as a child, the same age as her. And you see these two girls become friends. And of course, one is aware of who the other is. And it's it's a very beautiful and very special film. And I think the ending of the film is is doing that in a sense. And it's also, you know, on the one hand, it's about how baseball connected them, how Shoeless Joe connected them. But it's also about a father trying to make up for lost time. I mean, that's that's the greatest fantasy, of course, that you have more time mm-hmm. with, you know, when your father is alive and also when your father is no longer there. The sense of I could just have one more moment, if I could just make up for those lost moments, if I can make up for those moments that I botched, the moments, you know, where we were angry with each other. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it is beautiful. I do I do I can't say I got as choked up as I normally would watching this film like the first time I saw it, but uh, yeah, the the final line of like can play some catch. Yeah, it's uh, it, it is a lovely note to end the film on. And then you have uh, the film's one of the film's biggest visual strokes, the boldness of it, pulling back and seeing the long line of cars that are suddenly on their way to the the field. Yeah. And I'm like, they're coming now, now? in the middle. It's, it's been mi- five minutes. <laughs> she doesn't have her hot dog truck ready. Well, she's got like half a piece of a of a hot dog that was in a little girl's esophagus. <laughs> Beyond that, there's no hot dogs ready. 
<laughs> yeah, twenty dollars to walk in this field. Yeah, I guess. Like all the players have already gone back into the corn. Like there's nothing to see yet. Are people gonna go onto the field and like you know they're gonna see like Jose Canseco, Daryl Strawberry? I mean, they're gonna see like modern. Like, like does everybody have their own version of Field of Dreams? Players alive and 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 otherwise. I wonder if, like, are these a bunch of Ray Kinsella's who, you know, are spiritually heading to this pilgrimage and they're going to have their own nirvana when they get there? Maybe. I mean, I speak like about... they all see who they want to see. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's crazy. Like, they all get to see their dead dads. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets to play catch with their dead dad. Oh, that is so screwed up. <laughs> Like, I never got to play catch with my dad. Oh, man. And that's just like everybody's out there doing their own thing with their dead dad. Man, that is that is so messed up. <laughs> Jeez. And they make peace with themselves and their fathers. I mean, I, I think the idea is simply to 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 visualize if you he built it so they are coming. I think that's that's all we're supposed but to take. No, from but it's also <laughs> they did say people will pay for this experience. Twenty dollar donation. Yeah, and this money is going to save their farm. So there is this this idea that like I wish you had your because you always love to do the inflation thing. I would love to know how much. I mean, we'd have to. I mean, figure this out. Okay, so it's twenty dollars a pop. You've got at least what are we talking like what forty eight carloads? No. How many car hundreds? Oh, there were like it looked like. 200 cars. Do you think 200 cars? Okay, so 200 times 48. What? 200 times 48? What are you talking about? Oh, no, no. 20. Sorry. 20 times 48. Sorry. Added to zero. So 20 times 48. What's 48? 48 or did you say 400? I said there were like 200 cars. 200 cars. Okay, so it's like... dollars donation. $4,000. Okay. Just like that night? Yeah. Hmm. Well, in their money. Where are they going to park? It's a cornfield. $4,000. $4,000. Is it like Woodstock? Is there just going to be like mud and garbage everywhere? Um, Are they going to sleep on the field of dreams? Yeah. See, I, I don't know. There's like tens. I mean, like it turns into Woodstock. Okay. So $4,000 in what year was this? 1989. Oh, 1989. I got it wrong again. Did you put 87 again? No, I put 1998. Okay. $4,000. Well... Yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they It's would... a cool visual, though. It, it is. is. It is it a is. cool visual. Okay, so it's about $9,000. Okay, and how much do you think they need to save the farm? We're oh. talking like six figures, oh, right? Oh, we're talking like a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. But they're not going to make it all in one day. I mean... I'm... I know, but even like thinking about... I mean, again, like I, I have to think about this like Timothy Busfield would. Like, <laughs> where are you going to park all these people? What are they going to do... Where are they going to go to the bathroom? You know that you know that Warhol painting is getting lifted by <laughs> by somebody. <laughs> oh my gosh! I think it's it's a disaster. It's such a bad idea. But again, but you know, it's like, how do they know? Um, I'm interested. They're in, all hearing the voice. They're all hearing the voice, which is so. It's so it's basically 200 carloads full of insane people yes. ascending on this Iowa yes. farmhouse. Yes. It, it's wow. going to become the asylum of <laughs> dreams. Yes, <laughs> dreams. That's a good time. That's the sequel. Can I say there is one moment in the film where the movie almost tips its hat? Tips its hat. It's it's a uh, it's a really it's a really sarcastic joke, and I was really kind of annoyed that the movie even made it because like this movie is so sugary, but also so completely you know take it or leave it about its spirituality and its magic. There's a scene where Amy Madigan. The, as playing the wife, she's she's commenting about, you know, why do you have to have the voice? Why did you have to hear this? She goes like, couldn't Shirley MacLaine have heard the voice? <laughs> and that annoys me so much. This is when Shirley, this was But 89. that's at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, but still. Before this, she tells him. This, like, is in, this is in 89. So Shirley MacLaine, this is when Shirley MacLaine wrote this book, Out in a Limb, where she, you know, believes. I mean, it was a true, true book. At least she said it was, where Shirley MacLaine said, you know, she was... Uh, reincarnated a few times. She had a relationship with a guy who may or may not have been an extraterrestrial. Like I've read the book. It's it's you know it's it's crazy. Been, it's bananas. But still, it's like like you know what you know what time traveling ghost baseball movie. You do not <laughs> get to pick on Shirley MacLaine. How dare you? You leave her alone. You kooky movie. 
with your killer hot dog buns. Like you're this movie's insane. You have no right to pick on Shirley MacLaine. It's like the one time the movie picks a target. Like, no, 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 movie. You, you don't get to do that. No. No. No, if you build. Like, this movie is is so crazy. Yeah. So okay, well. That's, that's my, my, my. That's your one. That's my biggest beef of this movie. That's your like, biggest complaint. Not the fact have that to it pick, doesn't you have to make a, a Shirley MacLaine joke. You jerks. <laughs> Not to, the, the, the weird time travel. Doesn't, doesn't that make drives sense. me crazy. Because I'm thinking, like, you're 1972. Oh, man. Like, go see a Clockwork Orange and, you know, get a. Get, get like a couple smokes out of a cigarette machine and like have a tab and have a tab. you know buy some like buy first editions of some fantastic four and spider-man comics like you know Ooh, get an almanac a sports a almanac, sports almanac. <laughs> yeah why didn't he do that that way hey that would have saved his farm yeah he could have just got a sports almanac bet on baseball games yeah you know i don't know he could have asked all those dead players to to give juicy deals tales of the lives and like publish like you know the the unauthorized biography of Shoeless Joe Jackson and all the other players. There you go. There are ways to monetize this. Certainly, ways that make a lot more sense than having thousands of crazy people show up on your baseball field in the middle of the night to do God knows what. Yeah. Well, I, I think they're all gonna have their own experience. It's like. It's like if everyone is like doing mushrooms together, not that I would know because I've never done it, but they all have a different experience. They right. all see their own thing. So we've right? heard. Yes. So we've heard. Yeah. So that's probably what the field of dreams is going to do for them. I'll tell you what, though, and I'm, I'm not going to name names, although I don't think they'd mind. Um, some friends of mine recently have lost their fathers. And that's what hit me really hard last night. I don't know if you remember, but last night I had a hard time talking after the movie was over because I was really thinking about my dear friends, friends from high school and college who have recently lost their fathers. And I knew their fathers and I loved their fathers and, and you know, knew them in different ways. And and my father at this point of recording is still is still with us. Um, I have my, my father is someone who looms very large in my life, like Paul Bunyan. And sometimes it's the greatest thing and sometimes it's very hard. But uh, my father is someone who, when he's in the room with me, he's uh, he's a very big presence in my life. But he's that way when he's not there. And my father, at times, was a hero in my life. And sometimes my father was an obstacle. I'm speaking like any son. And this film is so much about that. And I'm, and I'm very serious about this. I, I do love this film so much. But I don't think of it as a baseball film. I think it is about the very complex and tricky and sometimes very hard way we think about our fathers as our heroes but also someone we we spend our entire lives chasing after and trying to live up to yeah i mean like don't you think it's more father and son in that way yeah but again i i do think it i do, I do think there is a purpose to ray having a daughter yeah. um that aspect of the film is very sweet she clearly dotes on everything her father says but in a sense he you know on the one hand, he's an absentee father because he takes off for this road trip and says goodbye to, to, to yeah, his wife and daughter. Yeah, he's gone for like a week. I mean, come But on. still, it's this insane pilgrimage while his farm is about to be repossessed and he's gone off to, to meet he, a countercultural he, hero who's been hiding. Okay, he had a dream <laughs> and his wife also had a dream. So you can't say no to that. So if, let's see, what would be the equivalent? Oh, so if I said, so Julia, I had this dream that I need to go to Bangor, Maine and meet with Stephen King and take him to a baseball game. Like, oh my gosh, I had the same dream. I'll go I'll go book you a ticket. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that is the craziest, stupidest thing. You are not going to Maine. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. I'm not as cool as Ray's wife. I would catch you on the phone being like, hi, um, my husband's crazy. <laughs> Google, how to get someone committed. <laughs> Google, how to make homemade chloroform. <laughs> Are those memory things from the Men in Black? Are those real? Can I get one of those and just like erase what just happened? I know the movie's old, but like, did the CIA make them? Like, <laughs> does like sharper image carry them? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, you know, for all the things in my life that you've you've supported me with that have been crazy or not practical, I can't imagine you saying like No, I no. would never like oh you're hearing voices and you have Yeah, yeah exactly. No. Yeah. That's why I said she is 
very supportive but in you the think it has everything to do way. but it's because they're they're hippy dippies i mean let's face it we have hippy dippy friends who you think like oh yeah they'd be all about this like hey my husband my husband's going on his field of dreams pilgrimage because he heard voices okay, and... but we also don't live in iowa so think about it <laughs> it's you... an iowa thing well no i don't think it's an iowa thing but i think maybe it's like they've been out in rural yeah. You know, field for so long that maybe they're both just like, you know what, we need to mix things up a little bit. We've been farming for too long. Hmm. You know? Interesting. Like, there's just maybe not enough excitement going on. Well, according to this movie, Iowa and heaven are basically the same place. <laughs> they say it twice, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. No. But seriously, I mean, I... I I didn't real remember like the road trip part of the movie, and there's so many things I didn't remember. It's mostly a road trip movie. That's the yeah. crazy thing. People always talk about this being one of or the absolute greatest baseball film, and I think that's because of the way the movie loves baseball so much. The characters do, but this movie really does, and I find that to be endearing um, because it's talking about you know it, it it talks about the Black Sox scandal, and it, you know it. It's dealing with these emotional aspects as well as these historical aspects that are troubling and complex. Yeah, yeah I, I do think this is a great film. I do. Yeah. Um, for me, it's three and a half stars. I'm, I'm giving it half a star less than I did back in 89. Because of the hot dog? Because it's crazy. <laughs> because this movie is nuts. Um, but again, it's like it's magical realism. Either you go with it or you don't. And, you know, I... <sighs> I mean, this movie is about as realistic as Star Wars. It really is. It's it's it has that much a relationship with the real world that we live in, um, but it's it's compelling. It is. Compelling. I, I like Field of Dreams a lot. Yeah. I do. Any final thoughts? Like, would you change the ending? Oh, I want Timothy Busfield to to be pulled into Field of Nightmares as much as you do. Oh, I yeah. definitely want the I want all the faces of the uh of the baseball players to like turn into like skeletal, you know, like like zombie. <laughs> You're like, no, he's like kicking and screaming. They please Ray Spank the no! <laughs> Hold off. I, I really want that so badly. I, I can't believe this movie lets its only villain off the hook so easily. But you know, it's such a sweet film. Yeah, it's it so sweet. It's my my dear friend Sana, who's no longer with us. I remember she once told me like she loves Legally Blonde because she's like that movie doesn't have a mean bone in its body, and I thought that was like such an endearing thing to say about that movie, and it's why I wound up seeing it. I feel the same way about this movie. Like it just, other than that unnecessary poke at Shirley MacLaine, this <laughs> is one of the sweetest films of one of the most cynical decades. Hmm. So right. how many stars would you give it? Yeah, I'd give it three. Okay. Yeah, because I really liked it. But again, there's, like you said, just some wild bananas things. And the part about going to the PTA meeting, there's just like, okay, <laughs> just some things that don't really need to be in there. But that, yeah, I don't know, that aspect I found compelling because we still deal with that stuff. Like they t they specifically oh, mentioned true. the diary of Anne Frank and Wizard of Oz being on the banned books list. It's they still are. So I... I find that compelling. Although, again, it's like it's a subplot for another movie, frankly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But, you know, three stars for some of the ridiculousness. What would you uh, say is the greatest baseball movie ever made? Oh. Do you have one? No. I, I don't know. Um, the Sandlot? <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, I think I've seen that like one time. Angels in the Outfield? <laughs> Do you remember that one? Yeah. That corny movie? That's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah. But I got to say, the lodging that movie, more airtight than Field of Dreams. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the angels, why they're there, makes a lot more sense. I want to see the one that you mentioned that you liked. The eight. eight Men Out? Yeah. It's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, I want to yeah. see that. We'll definitely watch that. And That's I did like film. Moneyball. Um, I love that movie. It is It yeah. is a terrific film. It yeah. is. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like you said, I think the greatest... Cobb, the movie about Ty Cobb, where he's played by Tommy Lee Jones. Terrific film, but, you know, it's a movie... It shows how ugly Ty Cobb was. Mm. And it doesn't have a lot of baseball oh, I liked in it. 42. 42 was good, yeah. Yeah, 42. I did like Yeah, that. with yeah. Harrison Ford in a character yeah. turn. Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't yeah. know. I like baseball movies. I do too. I But as, as someone who... I, I loved it when I was younger... I went to a Mets game, a New York Mets game in 86. It was just a couple games before they won the World Series, and I was a big fan of the 86 Mets. Um, I always thought baseball was always more fun to play than watch. 
because mm. I played in softball games and I think they're so fun. I love playing baseball, but like sitting down and watching an actual baseball okay. game. A baseball game is more fun to watch when you're in a stadium. Yes, or like when we go out in the field yeah, by I the mean, park and watch. Yeah, but yeah. like watching it on TV, no. Can't. I always feel like I'm missing something. I'm great. Yeah. There's something about being there. Yeah. It's, and it's all the stuff that Field of Dreams talks about. It's the sounds. It's the smells. If you build it, he will come. It's the hot dogs. Ease his pain with a hot dog. <laughs> go the distance and go back in time. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think we've covered everything. Uh, send your hate mail. To- <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> if you think there's a better baseball movie than Feel the James, please tell us because this is this is the one it, for me. It's always I always hear Feel the James of Bull Durham. Um, and it, these movies just to toggle back and forth as being my favorites. I think the greatest baseball movie ever made is, is Eight Men Out. But let me hear your, your thoughts on the matter. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.